FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today... Well, today is April 7th, 2020. Well, the coronavirus lockdown continues. Who knows how long it will last? I have a feeling it's going to last until people say, I don't care. I want to get back to work. If I spend another day with my kids, uh, the homicide investigators will have to be sent in Uh, another day with the wife. I mean, it's enough to drive a person to drink, and that's probably what you're out there doing. And, well, tell us what you're doing. We're curious. What have you been doing during the quarantine? And we'd love to get your feedback, your emails, kl at kerrylutz.com, kl at kerrylutz.com. Well, I wonder, what does one do? When do you start losing it? Because... When a, when a trip to the supermarket becomes the highlight of your day or Walmart or Target, then something bad is happening. Anyway, John, uh, happy Monday. So so what are you doing in this quarantine? Hey, Carrie. Oh, I'm, I'm drinking, like you said. You know, the, the best thing about Costco isn't their giant toilet paper containers. <laughs> it's, it's these these gallon bottles of cheap whiskey and cheap rum rum that they sell you know the kirkland brand yeah kirkland cognac is great bad. yeah kirkland cognac xo is yeah. amazing i just belted down a bottle over the past couple of weeks and i'm gonna have to go back and get another one but highly costco is the biggest seller of wine in the world and but, their house brands of vodka and such are not bad no, so I, I think that's what accounted for them running out of toilet paper is everybody yeah. was pretending to buy, you know, household stuff, but they were really going there to buy big giant bottles of whiskey and vodka. And <laughs> so you throw the toilet paper on top of the bottles of, of booze and it looks like you're, you know, you're trying to take care of your family. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that's, that's a yeah. good thing. Hey, you know, you got to look out for the family and you got to look out for yourself. We're all in this together. We are. And, and we're drinking heavily. Now, actually, um, you know, for people who work online like you and me, this this isn't Nothing. that big of a lifestyle change. But for a lot of people, my God, can you imagine what it would be like to, to be the guy who works at Costco or to be a waiter in a restaurant or, um, uh, you know, anybody who's in the hospitality or retail? This would be a nightmare because you'd have to go to work. But going to work risks your life. You know, you wouldn't know which person who who touched that box that you're scanning or or uh, is breathing in your direction has some kind of a disease that can hurt you. It would be it would be continuously stressful. I really feel for those people and hope this ends soon. Yeah. I, well, look, look at all the cops in New York City who've come oh. down with it. And, you know, John, what upsets me, you know, we have other things to talk about and the quarantine's just like we said so many times, you and I, we've been talking about this for nine years and we knew it was going to happen and it just happened to be the uh, COVID-19 virus that brought it about. But uh, the the people out there who uh, who weren't expecting it, you know, they're in total, complete shock still. And while the market's perked up a bit, uh, you know, over yesterday is up over, you know, the Dow is back over uh, 22,000. Uh, so it seems like uh, things maybe are getting back to normal. But when you look at the housing market, you know, a market assumes there are buyers and sellers. In the housing market, you know what it is? It's as if the stock screens went blank. How do you know what IBM is worth? How do you know what Google's worth? If there's no price up there, there's no price discovery, which is a primary function of a market, you have no idea what anything's worth. And that's where we're really at here. There's no price discovery in the real estate market. Well, yeah, yeah, because if you go to Zillow or someplace, the prices haven't changed. <laughs> it would be like looking at IBM or, or uh, some other big stock at the uh, two months ago price, right? Which wouldn't tell you anything. Like you said, no price discovery anymore. Um, so what will come? You know, how, housing isn't the epicenter of the crisis this time around like it was uh, back in 2006 to 2007. So it's more collateral damage. 
um, in, in a crisis that's happening for other reasons, mostly in other places. But um, it is going to be ugly in the um, the residential real estate market because, um, first of all, who's house hunting now? <laughs> I mean, yeah. do, you, do you really want to go touch other people's doorknobs and shake hands with realtors and stuff out, out in the world? Uh, most people would probably say no to that. Um, and at, at the same time, you've got a lot of people who have been laid off mm. and even though they're getting forbearance, in other words, if you have a mortgage, you don't have to pay that thing for, for a year, six months for a year. Okay. For a year. Um, wh which means you can basically stay in your house and that's, that's a lot of people right there who, who do not have to sell, but there are a lot of other people. I mean, think if your house is paid for and you've been using that as your savings vehicle, okay? And you didn't save a lot of money otherwise, but you had a ton of home equity in your house and now you get laid off and you've got this house, but you don't have any other savings. And so you kind of have to get money out of that house somehow and you've got to put it on the market. And that's also quite a few people or... Um, something that's kind of topical for where you live. If you've got a, a house in New York or New Jersey and a, a condo in Miami and your stock portfolio just cratered, you kind of have to choose one of those places to live in and sell the other, right? You, or you're going to feel pressure to do that because yeah. suddenly you aren't rich enough to have two places in two high price markets. So you would expect um, – houses to go down in price over time. And then the question is, how bad does it get? Because, you know, we've got these cross currents like all the mortgage forbearance and and super low interest rates and government just sending people checks and stuff like that. That's different from previous bubbles in which real estate just went straight down. So it's going to be tough to uh, well, it's hard to predict right now how bad it gets. But you know what? The numbers are starting to reflect stress because the uh, the number of purchase mortgages, in other words, not refis, but mortgages taken out in order to buy a house, um, just went way down year over year after levitating for a long time. Mm -hmm. And um, stuff like that, you know, that's a kind of an early indicator of what's happening. And, and house, new houses that are being listed for sale <clears throat> are also down year over year. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that is the, you know, the very early indicator of um, price declines. Because uh, right now, most people are used to bubble market prices, most sellers, you know, they, they price their house at the absolute highest price that that house has ever been priced at or sold for or anything three months ago. And now they're they're not getting any offers. They're not even getting anybody visiting. And they have to decide whether to just pull it off the market or cut the price. And probably both of those things will, will happen to an extent. But a lot of houses will have price cuts. And then the way markets work is that that spooks a lot of people and leads a lot of people who are you know, interested in buying a house right now and have the money to do it to pull back because they want to they want to see what happens. And now they're fantasizing about tossing these, you know, super low ball hand grenades yeah, out of the market. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> yeah. And, and seeing if anybody bites, because in in really weak real estate markets, you know, prices go down dramatically. And, it, you know, last time around, there were a lot of um, repos, you know, a lot of houses were taken back by the banks who kind of had to sell um, and, and weren't really that price conscious. They just had to get all that real estate that they didn't want to own off their balance sheet. So if something like that happens again, then uh, it's hard to say where the bottom is. And, uh, you know, I kind of think it probably won't happen on that scale, barring a 1930s style depression, which yeah. still is not an impossibility as crazy as things are out there. Yeah. Um, well, one thing on the real estate front, John, one of the biggest prime uh, demand components of the residential real estate market was potential Airbnb hosts. And oh, they're yeah. buying these things up, leveraging them, because you're getting a 30 to 40% return on investment annualized. And now nobody's, uh, nobody's renting the places because nobody can travel. No one's on vacation. I have a friend who has three of them. She's very fortunate. She owns them for cash. So she can sit back and the taxes in Florida pretty low. But many of you out there with Airbnbs are really feeling the pressure. That's where that loan forbearance can really come in handy. But there's an ambiguity in the way the law is written, John. And that is... You don't know whether after the forbearance, you have to just pay back all the back payments, whether they're adding it to the end of the mortgage or whether they're giving you a period of time to pay it back. 
over monthly payments, like over a year or something. And it could put people so deep in the hole, could put you so deep in the hole that you'll never get out. And eventually you have to walk away from the place. Yeah, because who wants to stay in an Airbnb now, right? You're, you're going into a stranger's house yeah. and touching their stuff. And, and there was, not only is it owned by a stranger, but there was a stranger in there the day before. Many. Sleeping there. Yeah. And, so, and now you, you see all this stuff about um, the COVID-19 living for three days on steel and nine days on plastic or whatever. So you don't know what you can touch. You know, you got You look at the toilet seat and think, well, what kind of material is that? You know, I wouldn't want to go to a RB or an Airbnb right now, I guess. And probably a lot of people feel the same way. So, um, uh, you know, a lot of these markets are, um, are being brought into question in terms of viability right now. For instance, if you're Carnival Cruise Lines, oh. Yeah. Are you going to be around in five years? And, and what, what do you do with cruise ships if there's no such thing as the cruise industry anymore? You know, Homeless I, I imagine they could be like condos, floating condos yeah. or something like that parked outside of New York City. But, um, you know, and, and, and so the Airbnb thing, the whole sharing economy, mm. which was basically the um, that was the lifeline for a lot of people. We had basically replaced or we've augmented the, um, the social safety net. Um, of unemployment and welfare and things like that with Uber and Lyft and Airbnb, where, you know, if, if you ran into trouble and lost your job or whatever, you you drove an Uber for a while or yeah. you started renting out part of your house via Airbnb. And, and so that was a social safety net. That was a thing that saved you and put food on the table when nothing else was doing it. And now those things have just yeah, uh, evaporated Imploded. is too strong a word because they still exist, but Vaporized. they are they're just truncated now. They are so much smaller than they used to be. All right, so funny story, John. Remember mm -hmm. that friend of mine? She lives in California. hasn't made a mortgage payment in twelve years. Literally, March or April was going to be her last month there. They were going to sell it off, and then she probably would have had a few more months before they evicted her. Assuming that she put them through that process. Why well, didn't she make a mortgage payment in 12 years? Uh, because so she had ran into trouble and then she could never get to anybody who would, was willing to do a modification. And she's claiming fraud and all these other things. Whatever. We'll, we don't need to pass on her on the merits of her legal argument because <laughs> the courts already have and they weren't buying it. So April was going to be foreclosure sale in California and then she'd have 60 90 maybe she could stretch it out to five six months uh, till she had to get out but now what's happened in Los Angeles County and in so many states all over the place is all foreclosure sales be they tax foreclosures or mortgage foreclosures have been put on hold for at least till they said till April 16th, but we know it's going to go to the summer, at least evictions for renters not paying their rent have all been put on hold until probably the summer. <laughs> and, you know, every part of the economy, John has to be bailed out every part of the economy, you know, at least, uh, at least during the 08, 09, period there were like there were some sectors of the economy that were flourishing but here there are none other than maybe undertakers because you still got to bury people and they oh. seem to be dying faster but outside there's of that the, i don't see it okay there's the stay-at-home stocks you know yeah. netflix and zoom. amazon are doing great zoom was till and, they were got investigated and there are gloom and doom financial websites <laughs> yeah that's us boy <laughs> all of a sudden yeah our sector is hot but um <sighs> You know, we, we for years we've been saying, and then they'll have to bail out everybody in sight. And, and people uh, are saying you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking yeah. about. You you don't have any idea about anything, right? We are totally this ridiculed. Is, this is even more extensive than what I had in mind. You know, I was thinking, all right, they'll have to bail out Fannie and Freddie again, and they'll have to bail out the big banks. You know, this kind of discrete parts of the economy. Yeah, AIG. But still, the pension funds, yeah, we'll have to bail out all those guys. But we haven't even gotten to the pension funds and the big banks and the states and Fannie and Freddie yet. You know, there, there's we're, we're still uh, just bailing out these almost random sectors. I, I don't want to say, you know, mortgage holders are random sectors, but they're, they're not these big identifiable 
parts of the financial system there that's really diffuse exactly. where money is just going every which way and it's nowhere near done yet you know argentina just defaulted on its dollar denominated debt today yes or i think yesterday it's appear it's appearing in the press today Correct. Uh, which means the um, emerging markets who owe trillions of dollars of dollar denominated debt to the, the big banks basically are going to have to be bailed out here pretty mm -hmm. soon because a lot of them are their resource based economies. In other words, they produce oil, which yeah. is now what Oops. 25 bucks a barrel. Yeah. yeah. So it, it, it's just beginning. In other words, the, uh, the bailouts are going to become bigger and more contentious as time goes on. Cause the easy part is giving money to individuals, right? That's politically popular. You, you don't have to use up any political capital to send those $1,200 checks out mm -hmm. to every adult in the country. But as time goes on and as the, the bailouts get more and more iffy, but they're going to have to happen anyhow, because with you yeah. can't let one domino fall in this kind of a world without it knocking down all the other dominoes. But, uh, you know, we're going to have to bail out Brazil or we're going to have to bail out Goldman Sachs to make good on their Brazilian bonds or something like that coming up. And, and that's going to be complicated and very ugly and very politically contentious when the time comes. So uh, this is nowhere near over. You know, if they, no. if they cure coronavirus tomorrow, uh, you still have all this financial crisis momentum that, it, that is going to last for another six months, even assuming that we then have growth. And, and you know, it's not clear that that we ever just go back to the normal as defined by like 2018 again, you know, because we, we're taking on all this new debt. Yeah. And uh, and at that, some point that blows up on us. So, yeah, it, it, if anything, gets more interesting and, and much scarier going forward than it has been for the last two months. Hey, uh, all I know is I was seriously considering rebranding the site, changing the name of the show from Financial Survival Network. I was feeling like I wasn't relevant anymore. Have to change it. And uh, just when I'm getting ready to do it this comes up. So now I'm not just uh, relevant, I'm ahead of the curve. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing you didn't do it because you would have been one of those signs of the turn in the market. Yeah. Things, you know, when Kerry Lutz for 10 years had this financial <laughs> you know, gloom and doom website and he changed it to something optimistic and then boom, the market collapsed. So yeah, well, I'm happy you, I did. you were going to be scared or spared that kind of bad press. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the amazing thing, John, is you and I were both right, and we weren't just stop clock. We always said, we have no idea when that's going to happen. We're absolutely sure it's going to, though. Totally sure. And as it turns out, of course, we were right. Not that that's uh, just for the sake of being right, but all the idiots who said that uh, the economy is fundamentally sound. I heard that one, and I knew we were really in trouble. Um, some politicians said it just like McCain said it in 08, and he promptly lost the race for president. Once you hear him saying the economy is fundamentally sound, if the, economy is, if the economy is fundamentally sound, you don't have to go around saying it. The only time you really need to say it is when it's not. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Osino Resources is a Ross Beattie-backed gold exploration company in mining-friendly Namibia. Osino's district-scale land package is situated near two producing gold mines, one of which Osino's management team previously developed and sold to B2 Gold. Osino's founders and management are experienced mining professionals who have already successfully successfully developed and sold two companies in the past seven years. Osino has a tight share structure, and with its current treasury, it can self-fund the advancement of its gold discovery into at least 2022. This is an exploration company with drills turning that you'll definitely want to pay attention to. Osino trades in New York under the ticker O-S-I-I-F, and in Toronto under the ticker O-S-I. To learn more, go to OsinoResources.com. That's OsinoResources.com. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Okay, two things about that. One, one is, um, you know, I've been early before, but I've never been this early before. And it, it feel, you know, five years early is basically wrong from my point of view, from, for me. You know, I, I don't feel like taking any credit for any of this because, damn, it should have happened in 2015. Yes. <laughs> and for some reason it went on and on. And, and 
which leads into the second part of this is why so many people thought things were basically okay. And the way you can come to that conclusion in a debt bubble is by looking at only the only one side of the ledger. If you um, if you don't include debt in your analysis, which Keynesian economics does not, and you only look at aggregate demand, in other words, how much st stuff we're buying, you can conclude that we're okay as long as we're buying a lot of stuff, even if we had to borrow an absolute insane amount of money to generate that outcome, because you're not paying attention to the debt. And that's the fatal flaw of Keynesian economics. So they, they don't look at debt, you know, they, they don't mm -hmm. care how much you have to borrow to get that outcome. Um, and that's really the most important part of the story, because you can't judge whether you got a good deal on something unless you know what you paid for it, right? And they ignore what you have to pay to get 4% unemployment or 3.2% GDP growth. And then, you know, this went on for a really long time because all these fiat currencies were considered valuable and they still are. So we're not at the end of the process yet. We, the end of the process is when they lose the ability to inflate away their troubles with their fiat currencies because nobody wants those currencies anymore. So that's the timing issue now. Not, not the, uh, it's, it's not an, if it's a when. And the, the timing has been so difficult to call so far that it's hard to say if this is it. But, you know, based on the numbers, it could easily be. I mean, we're going to how much debt is the U.S. going to take on this year just at the, at oh. the government level? Is it oh. going to be like four trillion more dollars? In five year? It's going to be something like that. We're five trillion at least, not yeah. even counting the Federal Reserve, their bailouts. And, and Japan is talking about a, um, a stimulus plan of 10% of GDP. Um, Germany is talking about, quote unquote, unlimited help for small businesses. Um, and, and the rest of Europe was already spending insane amounts of money to try to keep themselves afloat. So everywhere you look, the, the, any limitation on monetary inflation has been removed. And everybody's just going for it now. So... Um, you know, it's almost certain that we see kind of the standard um, script play out. We can't know the timing, but um, a, as debt starts to really soar and people start to pay attention to how much it is we owe, then everything falls apart. And, you, you know, you're seeing in the gold market right now where gold is approaching $1,700 an ounce, uh, which means it's at record levels almost everywhere else in the world except for the U.S. And in the U.S., it's heading for record levels. And, and um, what that means is people are losing faith in the financial management of their countries. So the, uh, the, the phase change in investor per perception and market psychology is, is beginning. You know, you're seeing the early signs of it happening. So here we go. <laughs> you know, and things could even get crazier. And that's yeah. exactly what Martin Armstrong has been talking about is he said gold would go up uh, when loss of faith in the government really takes hold. And he's been, he calls it the ECM, the economic uh, confidence model. And that's, that shifted. I don't remember. I think when, um, I guess around the end of last year, because when I was in January, was talking with a good friend about it. And he said, yeah, the ECM shifted. And uh, sure enough, all this has come after it. Yeah. Um, and he says it's not an inflation issue. You know, gold is not about inflation or the um, strength or weakness of the currency, but it is about the confidence we have in our government. Now, you know, to me, that's kind of the same thing, right? Because if you lose faith in your government, you lose faith in your currency because the currency is really yeah, it's one of the two or three things that the government has to manage. And, and so, I, you know, I think the people who talk about inflation and the people who talk about confidence in the government are kind of saying the same thing. They're, yes. they're just coming at it from different points of view, but they all arrive at the same place, which is right. gold and silver going through the room roof versus local currencies and the financial system breaking down because the price of real assets are soaring in a way that takes away the ability of central banks to manipulate markets. That's coming. Here's a question. And he actually was sent for another uh, guest, but I think you have an opinion on it as a long-term investor, two to four years. Why do I need to be concerned about non levered ETFs like GDXJ. I completely understand the reason that the J Nug, J Nuggets, 
et cetera, are death traps. But won't the non-levered ETFs go back to NAV relatively quickly? Please help me understand if there's something I'm missing here. And that's from Dan. Yeah, there, there are different animals in the, um, the ETF ecosystem. And the, the levered ones use futures contracts to replicate the behavior of a given market or sector. And there are other ones that actually own the stuff that you're buying. And, uh, you know, GDX is an example of that. They own stocks. Um, so unless, and, and this is not a um, 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 minuscule possibility, unless they screw up in some way. So they don't actually own what they, they claim to own. Yes. Or, and you're okay. Yeah. Or they're doing options um, in lieu of what they were supposed to own and there's decay. Avi Gilbert, yeah. uh, who's a great guest, said, beware of ETFs. And the other reason why is because not so much the ones backed up by commodities, but the ones backed up by stocks, as there was redemptions, they're natural sellers. And if there's a major crash, they just intensify the downward movement by magnitudes. And that's why you have to worry about them as opposed, even if you're in the individual stocks, that this this ETF is invested in the sector, et cetera, you know, you're kind of screwed. Yeah. That, that's a, a market wide issue with the uh, ETFs now outnumbering regular stocks Yes, and ETFs are kind of mechanical when, when the market goes a certain way, they automatically buy or sell to rebalance for that change in their market or their sector. Um, okay. Which I guess is a third issue <laughs> with, with ETFs because, um, there, there are, for instance, Sprott has a, um, a physical gold ETF, which is fairly close to actually owning the metal. It's still not as good as gold and silver in hand, but it, it's the closest you can get in the non-gold in your hand market to actually owning it. And it's very convenient. So that's one of the things that's defensible, buying something like that. And then you can move all the way out on the spectrum to those leverage things with yeah, the, um, with futures contracts yeah. where you use that for an in and out, in and out day trade, yeah, right? right exactly. but you do not put it in your IRA and forget about it because it will no. bleed value until it goes to literally zero. That's what they're programmed to do. They're programmed yeah. to self-destruct. Anyways, I just that question popped up as we were speaking. I thought it was a great, uh, way, great thing to talk about because I knew you would know. Uh, that's it for now. Make sure you go over to John's site, which is dollarcollapse.com. Check out our site, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for both our newsletters. One will be going out shortly. My article is, what is your house worth? Is it worth anything? Does your house have a worth? And also, don't forget the emails, kl at kerrylutz.com. That's kl at kerrylutz.com. John, until uh, next week, it's getting interesting. It is. Thanks, Gary. Talk to you next week. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Thank you.